Network, February 25th, 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, for my last free Black History Month lecture in the series Black Resistance Movements in the Fight for Freedom from 1630 BC to today and attacks on voting rights and the teaching of African American history. Visit my website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, to register right now. Even if you can't attend live, you can still register for it and watch it because the broadcast will be archived. We'll look at the Hyksos invasion of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt in the 1630s uh, in the BC era. We'll look at the Black Exodus of 1879, 6,000 African Americans migrating out to Kansas. We'll also look at after Reconstruction ends in 1877 and the rewriting of the state constitutions like the Mississippi State Constitution of 1890, which imposes poll taxes and literacy tests. And that is directly related to the attack on voting rights today. At 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I will do another session of my new 12 week online course. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Register for that 12-week online course at theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Right now, let's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Saturday, February 18th. Uh, 2023. So this is uh, part three of our Saturday Black History Month um, free lectures. And if you missed the first two, um, they're archived. You can go back and watch them. Uh, if you go to our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, uh, you'll see them, uh, the links archived right on the home page, but also they're right here in Crowdcast, which is the service that I'm using to broadcast um, this class right now. Okay, so we did them uh, uh, Saturday, February 4th and Saturday, February 11th, 2023. Then you know at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today, I teach class number two of my 12 week online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So that class we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. If you have not uh, registered for that 12 week online course where we get deep into this history, uh, I'm gonna post the link here and uh, we do those sessions live. All those sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime, even a year from now, two years from now. Um, so in that class is, 80, is on sale $80, regularly $130. All right, so we're going to um, look at uh, today, we'll, we'll, we'll look at uh, today and next Saturday, we'll look at black resistance movements, um, 1630 BC, to 2023 Common Era. Common Era is the equivalent to AD. So 1630 BC up until now, okay? Uh, last class, I said when we met again today, we would talk about Ida B. Wales, Ida B. Wales 1892, and how she got involved in the anti-lynching movement and dealing with the Moss store murders in Memphis, Tennessee of 1892, okay? So we're gonna talk with it. So that, that will be the first one that we uh, uh, look at uh, today. All right, now just to, uh, just to recap, because I've seen a number of different things dealing with Black History Month, African American History Month um, in the media, okay, in the media, and uh, almost none of it has talked about this year's annual theme for African American History Month, okay? So, you know, uh, I'm a historian, and I have a lot of respect for Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who co-founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, uh, September 9th, uh, 1915. Uh, if you missed last week's class, and actually what I'll, uh, what I'll do, I'll post the link here, so you can register for class number two because we got deeper into the history of Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the uh, uh, co-founding of the uh, Associ of ASALA, Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. We got deeper into that conversation. 
um, if we look at here, just to recap, this year's annual theme uh, coming from Asala is black resistance, black resistance, okay? And let me pull this up here, uh, right here, yeah, Asala.org, okay? So just to look at this briefly, because, you know, I when I talk to people and I talk to people who are older than me, I'm 51 years old, I'll be 52 June 7th, I talk to people older than me, 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, they don't know that there's an annual theme for Black History Month, and there has been an annual theme since 1928, okay? So just to, just to recap here, for those that don't know, this year's annual theme from Asala, and Asala is the organization that created Negro History Week in 1926, which became Black History Month in 1976. Uh, 2023, uh, Black History Theme Executive Summary, Black Resistance, Black Resistance. Now, African Americans have resisted historic and ongoing oppression in all forms, especially the racial uh, terrorism of lynching, racial pogroms, or uh, pogroms meaning uh, plans to exterminate people uh, or ethnic groups of people, and police killings since uh, our arrival upon these shores. That should be changed from our arrival on these shores to Europeans arrival on these shores. Cause as we talked about in uh, lecture number two, last week, February 11th, 2023, we, we dealt with the African presence in the land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years. And African people were already here when Europeans came to this land, when the Spanish came, in 1513 with Juan Ponce de Leon, when uh, the Spanish tried to set up settlements in the area that is today, South Carolina and Georgia in 1526, 93 years before Virginia in 1619, when you have uh, the English coming in 1607, when you have the Dutch coming in the 1620s, African people were already here. Okay, so that needs to be changed from when we arrived upon these shores to when Europeans arrived upon these shores. Because as we talked about last class and we referenced Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, one of the names for this land was Turtle Island. And this was our land stolen from us. Yes, it was also stolen from Native Americans. But you have to understand who some of those Native American nations were because you have different groups of African people who were already here when Europeans got here and many of those groups of African people got renamed or relabeled as Native Americans. So we think of Native American, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, uh, you know, uh, different uh, Creek, different Native American nations, but we don't know, well, wait a second, one of the ways that our numbers were absorbed is by renaming us and, and relabeling us Native American, et cetera. Okay, so, um, these efforts have been to, to th th these efforts have been to advocate for a dignified self-determined life in a just democratic society in the United States and beyond the United States political jurisdiction. The 1950s, 1960s and 1970s in the United States was defined by actions such as sit-ins, boycotts, walkouts, strikes, uh, by African Americans and white allies in the fight for justice against discrimination in all sectors of society from employment to education to housing uh, uh, to housing um, African Americans have had to consistently African Americans have had to consistently uh, push and let me uh, losing my space here I'll just a second African Americans have had to consistently push the United States government to live up to its ideas of freedom, liberty, and justice for all. Systematic oppression has sought to negate much of the dreams of our griots like Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston and other freedom fighters like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Septima Clark, and Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, who fought uh, who, these dreams that they fought to realize. African Americans have sought ways to nurture and protect black lives and for, a, uh, and for autonomy of their physical and intellectual bodies through armed 
resistance through armed resistance, voluntary immigration, meaning leaving the country, going somewhere else, like uh, going back to Africa, going to Liberia, et cetera, nonviolence, education, literature, sports, media, and legislation, polit slash politics. African-American led institutions and affiliations have lobbied, litigated, legislated, protested, and achieved success, okay? So then they go on, they, they talk about different uh, examples of African people resistant, resisting, whether we talk about Haiti, the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1803, whether we talk about uh, uh, fighting against murderous white mobs in Memphis, Tennessee, 1892, which we'll talk about today, Rosewood, Florida, January 1923, the movie from 1997 directed by um, uh, John Singleton, Rosewood, New Orleans, Louisiana, 1900. We're going to try to squeeze that in today. That's the Robert Charles riot of 1900. This brother right here, that movie needs to be made. That, that, uh, uh, that incident needs to be made into a movie. Additionally, some African-Americans thought that the best way to resist was to self-liberate as seen by the actions who uh, uh, seen by the actions, those who left the plantation system of Henry Adams and Benjamin Papp Singleton, uh, which they led a mass exodus westward in 1879 and Bishop Henry McNeil Turner of the African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, who organized immigration to Liberia. OK, so read the rest of this here. This gets deep. So this th this is the executive summary of this year's annual theme for African-American History Month, which is uh, uh, black resistance and black resistance movements. OK, so. This uh, this lecture today and next Saturday, 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, we're going to explore some more of these topics. All right. So let me uh, post a link here because so many uh, people I talk to don't know there's been an annual theme for Black History Month since 1928. OK. And these themes also don't just look at in Black History Month or African American History Month was not just designed to look at accomplishments and achievements of African people here in the United States, but also on the continent of Africa as well. So a lot of the way that we uh, celebrate Black History Month is just is just wrong. And we're not getting the full effect from it. We're not getting the full impact from it because we haven't studied the origins of it. And we, and we haven't studied Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Okay. And, and sometimes I attend black history month celebrations or hear people talk about black history month. I'll see, we'll see segments on TV, MSNBC. They won't even mention Dr. Carter G. Woodson. That's like, that's like celebrating Christmas and don't mention Yeshua or who the English have taught us to call Jesus. Because, the, the, now this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. This may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness just because you disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. The letter J, and we get into this, uh, we talked about this uh, class number one uh, last Saturday in uh, the, the 2 p.m. Uh, online, the 2 p.m. Uh, a uh, 12 week online course that I do. Um, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. The letter J wasn't invented until 1630 AD. The letter J is derived from the letter I. Okay. The letter J wasn't invented until 1630 AD. When you look at the letter, when you look at the word Jesus in the dictionary and you look at the etymology of the word, it takes you back to Yeshua, which is, which is Hebrew. All right. Okay. So, How's everybody doing? Can you all hear me okay? Everybody all right? Get your questions together. Uh, you can post your questions here, all right? Because I, um, I have to jump off uh, right around um, about 20 minutes before 2 to get ready for my online class, okay? Now, Dr. Woodson's uh, most famous book was The Miseducation of the Negro. OK, this book right here, The Miseducation of the Negro, which came out in 1933, give you a little background information on why he created Negro History Week. 
Dr. Woodson founded Negro History Week in 1926. He explained the reason behind the celebration in a pamphlet widely distributed months before the first celebration was to take place during the second week in February 1926. In commemoration of Frederick Douglass's birthday, Frederick Douglass's assumed birthday, which was uh, February 14th. Douglass didn't know the exact year or date that he was born. OK. Um, and then also Abraham Lincoln's birthday, which is February 12th. Now, we know Chris Berman of ESPN when talking about uh, Patrick Holmes and J Patrick Mahomes and, and Jalen Hurt, uh, the, the historic matchup of two African-American quarterbacks in the Super Bowl. Uh, we know uh, uh Chris Berman of ESPN reminded us that the Super Bowl was taking place on Abraham Lincoln's birthday. So we talked about that on uh, Faraji Muhammad's show, The Culture, on the Black Star Media Network, which is Roland Martin's network. Okay, I was on his show on uh, Monday, February 13th, 2023. Now, um, he exclaimed, Dr. Woodson exclaimed that African Americans knew practically nothing about their history. African-Americans knew practically nothing about their history. He ultimate, ultimately believed that African-Americans could benefit immensely from their past uh, and accomplishments of their ancestors. He added that race prejudice was the byproduct of whites, uh, of, of whites' beliefs that black people had not contributed anything of worth to world civilization, okay? He contended, he, he added that race prejudice was the byproduct of whites' beliefs that black people had not contributed anything of worth to world civilization. So Dr. Woodson argued that if the historical record was set straight and, and that if the history of African Americans were studied along with the achievements of others in schools, not only would African American youth develop a sense of pride and self-worth, but racism would be abolished because Dr. Woodson said that the history of African-Americans had to be taught in all schools across the country, not just the schools where we were the majority of the population. All schools, uh, all schools across the country had to teach this history, had to be incorporated into the history that was already being taught. Dr. Woodson concluded, quote, let truth destroy the dividing prejudice of nationality and teach universal love without distinction of race, merit, or rank. With sublime enthusiasm and heavenly vision of the great teacher, let us help men rise above the race hate of their age on, unto the altruism of a rejuvenated universe. Now, Negro History Week was the first major achievement in popularizing black history. So Dr. Woodson is known as the father of black history and the father of Black History Month. Uh, and, and, and Negro History Week was unique in that it focused on African, Amer on African American youth. Dr. Woodson realized, uh, Dr. Woodson realized that the miseducation of black people began in their homes, communities, and elementary schools. Okay, the miseducation of black people began in their homes, communities, and elementary schools. All right. So, uh, Dr. Woodson's vision, Dr. Woodson's vision uh, of Negro History Week was optimistic, strategic, and long term. He wanted this modest, week long celebration to serve as a stepping stone toward the gradual introduction of African American history, black history, into the curricula of all levels of the U.S. educational system. Let me repeat this. He wanted this modest week-long celebration to serve as a stepping stone toward the gradual introduction of African-American history into the curricula of all levels of, US, of the U.S. educational system. So Dr. Woodson hoped Negro History Week would evolve into Negro History Year as he affirmed from time to time. Woodson consistently instructed those observing the week that they needed to diligently prepare. They needed to diligently uh, prepare uh, for the celebration months in advance and that after mid-February, 
uh, they needed to continue acknowledging the role of African descendants in world history. So he, he never designed for this to be the only time of the year that we study our history. OK, it's a cultural celebration. And he and, and, and he felt that that week out of the year or month out of the year, African-American students should also show and demonstrate what they have been studying year round. Dr. Woodson said Negro History Week should be a demonstration of what has been done in the study of the Negro during the year. And at the same time as a demonstration, demonstration of greater things to be accomplished, end quote. This is and this is what Dr. Woodson instructed school teachers on. OK, Dr. Woodson said that a subject. Uh, uh, which receives attention one week out of the 36 will not mean much to anyone. He, he so the, the way our whole conception of a lot of this is just totally backwards. It was never designed to be the only time of the year we celebrate our history. And then you have some people who say, oh, well, we have the shortest month of the year. OK, that has nothing to do with that. That has to do with. Uh, previously on the Jilean calendar with Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar took a day from uh, the month of February or the equivalent of February because the, because the different months had 30 days. Julius Caesar wanted his month of July, which was named after him, to have 31 days, more days than any other uh, uh, month. And then Augustus Caesar, who the month of August is named after Augustus Caesar did not want to be outdone by Julius Caesar. So he took a day from the month of February also. So he would have 31 days as well. This is why February is, is the only month with 28 days. But if you just have to have 30 days, if you just have to celebrate uh, black history month for 30 days, just so you can feel like it has legitimacy. Okay. You can celebrate March 1st and March 2nd if you just have to have 30 days. Nobody's going to take your black card if you continue to celebrate Black History Month March 1st and March 2nd, just so you can feel whole, just so you can have some self-esteem, okay? All right, let's continue. Read Dr. Uh, uh, Pero uh, Dagbovi's book, Dr. Pero Gaglo Dagbovi, who's a history professor um, here in Michigan, he's at Michigan State University. Fantastic book that he wrote, Carter G. Woodson in Washington, D.C., The Father of Black History. This excerpt comes with pages 100 through 102. All right, so um, we talked about, uh, let me see, we'll we leave off here. Okay, so I wanted to do that intro because I know we have some uh, new people uh, who went here for the class uh, last week. And if we, let's see here, that was the 11th. Let me post the link here. Let me see if I have it here for last class. Okay. Here's the link for our lecture from February 11th, 2023. Post it right here. It's here in Crowdcast. So you can watch that one also if you missed that. All right. Now let's look at um, Ida B. Wells and how she got involved in the anti lynching movement. Because at the end of last week's session, I said we would start. Uh, this week with this because we ran out of time okay and I know we're gonna run out of time for some stuff today so we're gonna start uh, we'll do it uh, we'll continue uh, next class uh, I talk about uh, Ida B. Wells in my presentation great African women in history uh, the mothers of civilization and uh, where is that here Pull this up here. Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. Um, and that's a four hour press. That's a, actually a four hour lecture that I do. Let me pull this up here uh, on Ida B. Wells. There's also a good article from PBS.org, Public Broadcasting System, PBS.org, 
on um, on Ida B. Wells. Hold on, let me see something here. Where is this? Okay, she should be in here. Okay, anyway. Uh, okay, let's continue. So, this piece right here, uh, this deals with the Moss, Moss Stewart murders of uh, 1892 in Memphis, Tennessee. Ida B. Wells forced out of Memphis, Tennessee. So if you know anything about her, you know she had to, um, she was getting death threats in uh, Memphis and had to flee Memphis to save her life. So uh, this is from the Jim Crow Stories Public Broadcasting System, PBS.org, The Rise and Fall of Jim Crow. All right, uh, in March of 1892, Ida B. Wells, uh, who was a journalist, and former uh, Memphis school teacher started a crusade uh, against lynching after three uh, friends of hers were brutally murdered by a Memphis, Tennessee mob. Now, Tom Moss and two of his friends, Calvin McDowell and Henry Stewart, were arrested for defending themselves against an attack on Tom Moss, uh, Tom Moss store. So his store was the People's Grocery Store, okay? And this was a, a African American owned grocery store there in Memphis, Tennessee, that competed against the white owned grocery store and did very well uh, competing against the white owned grocery store. All right, now, um, Tom Moss and two of his friends, Calvin McDowell and Henry Stewart, were arrested for defending themselves against an attack on Tom Moss's store. Tom Moss was a highly respected figure in the African-American community. He was a postman as well as the owner of a grocery store. A white competitor enraged that Tom Moss had drawn away this white competitor's African-American customers, hired some off-duty deputy sheriffs to destroy Tom Moss's store, the People's Grocery Store. Okay, now Tom Moss and his friends were there at the grocery store, okay, when, when, when these deputy sheriffs broke in, and not knowing that the men were deputy sheriffs, rightfully so, they exercised their right to defend themselves and defend the store. So a gun battle breaks out, and several deputies were wounded. Tom Moss, his two friends, and one and 100 other African American uh, supporters were arrested. Several nights later, masked vigilantes dragged Tom Moss and his friends from their cells, took them to a deserted railroad yard, and shot them to death. They were lynched. They were executed. Shot them to death. Enraged by their deaths, Ida B. Wells lashed out at the refusal of Memphis police to arrest the well-known killers. Ida B. Wells encouraged African-Americans to protest with boycotts of white-owned stores and public transportation. Because one of the ways, when I showed you that executive summary from Asala, Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, one of the ways that we historically fought back against white supremacy and racism, domestic terrorism, et cetera, is through sustained, targeted economic withdrawal strategies, various types of economic withdrawal strategies, okay? Unfortunately, because so many of our organizations have been co-opted one way or another, either, either inadvertently on their part or intentionally on their part, that's why you don't hear about really any economic boycotts today especially nationwide economic boycotts or anything like this. And, and we really should be engaged in targeted, sustained economic withdrawal strategies. This is something that, this is something that Dr. King correctly uh, taught us. Uh, and, and he talked about in his last speech, um, I've been to the mountaintop where he called for a boycott of uh, 
uh, Coca-Cola, Hearts Bread, Wonder Bread, uh, uh, and Seal Test Milk in, in Memphis, Tennessee because of their discriminatory hiring practices. He was, he was speaking to the sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee, okay? And Dr. King said that we have to always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. He said we have to always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. The mistake that's made, and you have a lot of people who mean well, okay, the mistake that's made is that when we have these mass protests, when we have these uh, marches and things like this, usually there's no economic component tied to it. Number one, at the end of your march, you should march yourself down to African-American-owned businesses and buy them out, number one. Number two, so just like, just like the protest that happened this past week down in Florida, and you had people traveling down to Florida, Reverend Al Sharpton, other pastors, things like this, to protest against the Florida Department of Education, as well as Governor Ron DeSantis, and I've said before, Florida needs to be desanitized. Uh, Governor Ron DeSantis, um, yeah, I'm talking about voting him out of office. I I'm not talking about anything violent against him, uh, just so people understand. Um, th th that deals with the um, Florida Department of Education and Governor Ron DeSantis uh, banning the uh, AP African American Studies course, okay? Well, one of the things that should happen at the end of your march is to go uh, to African-American-owned businesses and spend money with them and support them, okay? So a lot of the, uh, a lot of this, and I'm, I'm gonna talk about this on, on our show Sunday, because uh, I talked about this on Faraji Muhammad's show, The Culture, when I was on on Monday. Um, a lot of, when we look at our history, we had a history of fighting back economically targeted sustained economic boycotts, redirecting uh, our dollars to our own communities. Um, you look at the 1981 economic boycott of uh, Coca-Cola that uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson did, okay, nationwide economic boycott. You know, we don't have things like that today. And, and, and this is why we actually need to study this history to understand how we fought back how we fought back against white supremacy and racism different ways a different methods of black resistance but not resisting for the sake of resisting resisting to actually win to actually accomplish something okay uh this article here from uh cnn.com what day this is college board hits back at florida's initial Rejection of AP African American uh, Studies course and admits it made mistakes in rollout. Okay, because we talked about this um, uh, on Monday, uh, February thirteenth. Okay, read this one here from um, CNN.com, and then there was also another article that I that I saw from CNN that actually deals with the. Um, okay, hold on. This is freezing up. There's another article that I also saw from CNN that actually deals with the uh, protest that took place down there. All right, let's continue. Hold on, where are we? Right here. Okay. Just a second. I have to close out some of these tabs here. All right. Why is this? Let me clear this out. Stand by. Okay. Uh, let's continue. All 
Okay, let's go back to uh, this peaceful night of you whales. If you have any questions, post your questions here also. Okay, so enraged by their deaths, Ida B. Wells lashed out at the refusal of Memphis police to arrest the well-known killers. She encouraged African-Americans to protest with boycotts of white-owned stores and public transportation. Now, the uh, lynchings were a turning point in Ida B. Wells' life. Okay, she began, uh, she began to investigate and reveal the real motivations that lay behind lynching. Like many uh, middle-class African-Americans, Ida B. Wells had accepted the myth that only poor blacks were lynched for heinous crimes, okay? Like many middle-class African-Americans at the time, Ida B. Wells accepted the myth that only poor African-Americans were lynched for heinous crimes. Ida B. Wells was now shocked into recognizing that even innocent middle-class black people could be targets. As well uh, as Ida B. Wells investigated the reasons for lynching, she discovered that a number of victims were lynched not for rape, but for having sexual relations with consenting white women, okay? So this gets into white women sexually desiring African-American men. And what happens is, is that uh, her husband finds out, her brother finds out, her father finds out, her cousin finds out. They go and capture the African-American man and lynch him but it was actually consensual sex or she may, she may yell rape uh, or she may have been pressured to say it was rape or something like this and lie on him. Or she may just make up a fictitious Negro. Like in the case of um, Rosewood, January, 1923, where the, the white woman was, uh, she was cheating on her husband with a white man. She was cheating on her white husband with a white man and her, 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 her white lover beat her. She lied and said it was this fictitious black man that broke in and beat her. Now she, she didn't say that he sexually assaulted her, but as the story got told over and over again by white people, then, you know, sexual assault was added in things of this nature. Okay. That's what happened to Rosewood, Florida, Florida, where Ron DeSantis is. And th that racist white mob ran all those African-Americans off their land in, in, in Rosewood because we owned homes on land in, in Rosewood, Florida. And then these white people took control of that land and they removed Rosewood, Florida off of the map. That's how devastating Rosewood was. They re removed Rosewood, Florida off of the map. It's going to be decades later that the survivors are going to get some type of, of some type of restitution led by uh, Arnett doctor who was a survivor and he's and he's depicted in the movie Rosewood. He's a little boy in the movie. Okay. With, with Ving Rhames and John Voight and the character of Ving Rhames, the character of man, that's a fictitious character. Okay. The character of man doesn't even exist. Okay. That's a fictitious. He's probably a composite character, probably a composite of um different um actions by different real life people okay let's continue all right so quote nobody in this idb well said nobody in this section of the community believes that old threadbare lie that negro men rape white women if southern men are not careful a conclusion might be reached which will be very damaging to the moral reputation of their women okay now the suggestion uh that white women would willingly the suggestion that white women would willingly uh have sexual relations with african-american men enraged white people in memphis tennessee 
since Ida B. Wells did not sign her name to her editorials. The white press assumed a man had written the article. The white press assumed a man had written the article. Now, the white newspaper, um, one of the white newspapers there was called the Memphis uh, Scimitar, okay? And the Memphis Scimitar advocated a violent response. It said, quote, it will be true. It will be the duty of those whom he has attacked to tie the wretch to a stake, brand him in the forehead with a hot iron and perform upon him a surgical operation with a pair of shears, end quote. This is what they actually, this is what white people actually published in the newspaper, okay, in, in Memphis, Tennessee. And so they're talking about castrating this, this African-American man. Now, a mob, a white mob, destroyed Ida B. Wells' newspaper office while Ida B. Wells was out of town. And this forced uh, her to remain in the North. Ida, Ida B. Wells launched a national crusade against lynching that would capture the attention of the nation and Europe. Okay. And she, be, she becomes involved in the fight for a federal anti-lynching bill. As we talked about last class, uh, it took 122 years to get a federal anti-lynching bill passed. Okay. Uh, the, the first federal anti-lynching bill was passed and it was was introduced in Congress in uh, 1900 by Representative George Henry White. OK, introduced in 1900 by Representative George Henry White. And he was the he was the last African-American who was left in uh, Congress. OK, because after Reconstruction ends in 1877, then you have. Uh, the southern states who are going to rewrite their state constitutions and impose poll taxes and literacy tests and poll taxes uh, actually the poll tax actually starts in Florida in 1889. OK, then in 1890, uh, Mississippi rewrites their state constitution. And, and this becomes known as the Mississippi plan. And the Mississippi plan was the model that the other Southern states are going to use to uh, suppress the African-American vote with uh, poll taxes, literacy tests, and, and, and some of them adopt the, uh, you know, the, the grandfather clause starting in 1898 with Louisiana, when Louisiana, when Louisiana rewrites their state constitution. Um, so you're going to, um, you, you're going to see this take place. So we get wiped out in, in Congress. So George Henry Wright introduced introduces the first anti lynching bill in 1900. It is not until 1922, okay? It's not until it's not until I'm sorry, it's not until 2022, with um, when it passes Congress and the and the Senate and it's signed into law by President Joe Biden, the Emmett Till anti lynching bill. It took 122 years to get a federal anti lynching bill passed. Okay, so go ahead and post your comments here and check out this article uh, dealing with uh, Ida B. Wells from uh, PBS.org. Ida B. Wells forced out of Memphis, 1892. Go ahead and post your comments here. Uh, so let's look at another example. Let's look at another example. And I want to, okay, we did Ida B. Wells. Um, I want to look at Queen and Zynga. OK, another example of black resistance. And we're looking at different examples throughout history. 1630 uh, B.C. We'll talk about the Hyksos invasion of Kemet next uh, next Saturday, next Saturday's uh, lecture. So we know that um, the series on Netflix from executive producer Jada Pinkett Smith is dealing with uh, it's called African Queens, African Queens. In each series, they look at different African queens. And one of my teachers, Professor James Small, was a consultant uh, on the project, okay? And I interviewed him, uh, it was in January when I interviewed him, and we discussed this. Um, there's an article from okafrica.com. 
uh, because the, fir the, the first installment that aired, it uh, came out February 15th on Netflix. And the first installment deals with Queen Nzinga or Njinga, okay, of in the in the area that's present day uh, Angola. That was the uh, uh, the uh, Matamba, the uh, kingdom of uh, Matamba. All right, now uh, this article here. Jada Pinkett Smith on how she found her queen in Jenga for Netflix's uh, African Queens. Okay, so check this out. This is from OKAfrica.com. But if we if we look at some, uh, briefly here some history dealing with uh, Queen and Zynga. and this deals with uh, the this deals with uh, these Africans fighting against the Portuguese. Um, the Portuguese colonizers, especially. Uh, there's a good article from uh, blackpass.org, blackpass.org. Called uh, Queen and Zing of 1583 to 1663. Let's take a look at this here. Okay, how do you all like this type of information? And if you have any questions, you can post your questions here also. Now, who still needs to register for uh, the 12-week online course that I teach on Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time? And then if you haven't registered for it, as soon as you register, you can watch class number one because we do those sessions live. All those sessions are archived and recorded. That's uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And... Uh, we have the information right on the homepage of our website. Also, I'll post the link here as well. Um, let me see. Let's go flip over to this here. All right. How you doing, Harold? Harold said, excellent history. Um, this here. Okay, so when you go right to our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, scroll down, it has the information for our radio show, Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m. WFDF here in Detroit. Uh, we also broadcast on Facebook and YouTube, the African History Network on Facebook, and Michael M. Hotep on YouTube. Uh, has our Cash App, PayPal information, has the information about the uh, uh, Saturday uh, Black History Month lectures. And then uh, information about the 12 week online course here. Angie Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade. We do the sessions live, all the sessions are archived. So if anything that you miss, you can watch it on demand as much as you want to. The class is on sale $80, regularly $130. So um, next class is Saturday, February 18th, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We also have a bundle pack of courses. So you can uh, get that course and the second one that I teach. Uh, that starts up uh, Sunday, February 26, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1800 to 1968. So we have a bundle pack of the courses. You get both courses for $120. There's also five bonus lectures that will be in the video library section when you uh, log into your account. Uh, you get five free lectures from me as well. Okay, so we have the information right on the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. And I'll post a link here uh, again so you can register uh, for the 12 week online course that I teach. And we do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, um, et cetera. Okay. And, okay, will you, Rob asked the question, will you cover material on the 1877 compromise? Absolutely. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> You can't deal with the Jim Crow era till you deal with the compromise of 1877. We deal with history from uh, in the in the Sunday class that starts up uh, Sunday, February 26. And this bonus content you can start watching as soon as you register for that. From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1800 to 1968, we deal with history leading up to the Civil War, which starts in 1861. Then we deal with the Civil War, 1861, 1865. And we deal with the Reconstruction era, 1865, 1877, and the Compromise of, Compromise of 1877, which, end re, which ends Reconstruction. 
We deal with all that history. We go through chronologically and look at that history. We, uh, we deal with the Jim Crow era, World War One, World War Two, Great Migration, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement. Okay, so uh, let's look at Queen Nzinga here. Uh, she was born in 1583. Uh, so Queen Nzinga, uh, Nzinga uh, Bondi, the monarch of the, uh, of the Mbundu people, was a resilient leader who fought against the Portuguese and their expanding slave trade in Central Africa. Remember that the Portuguese were the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade. They get involved basically 1441 with Anton Gonzalez going into Mauritania and taking out 12 Africans from Mauritania, taking them back to uh, Portugal, okay? Uh, the, the British were not the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade. It's the Portuguese, and the Spanish are right behind them. So Spain and Portugal were competing for control of the transatlantic slave trade and to see who can conquer the most territory, extract the most mineral wealth out of the territory, and rebuild their respective nations also. Because remember, the, Europe had been devastated by... Uh, uh, civil war, famine, and definitely devastated by the Black Death, the bubonic plague, which hits in spurts from 1347 to 1400. So Europe had lost between uh, one quarter to one third of its population, somewhere between 25 million to 75 million people because of the Black Death, okay? So as Dr. John Henry Clark correctly explained, Europe was land poor, people poor, and resource poor. Okay, so the, uh, the Portuguese were not just in West Africa. The Portuguese are also in Central Africa also. Now, during the late 16th century, the French and the English uh, threatened the Portuguese uh, near monopoly on the, on the sources of African slaves along the West African coast. Okay, so the, the, all these European nations are competitors. The French and the English threaten what the Portuguese have going on in West Africa forcing the Portuguese to seek new areas of exploitation. By 1580 Common Era, or AD, um, the Portuguese had already established a trading relationship with uh, King Alfonso I in the nearby Congo Kingdom. They, t they then turned to Angola, south of the Congo. Now, the Portuguese established a fort at the settlement at Luanda in, the con in uh, Angola, in uh, uh, 1617, okay, in 1617. And um, you have in, in, in encroaching, they're encroaching on Mbundu land. In 1622, they invited King Bondi, uh, Angola Bondi, who's, who's uh, Queen Nzinga's brother. He's the king at this point in time. She does not become queen until 1626 after he commits suicide. The Portuguese invite uh, uh, Bondi to attend a quote-unquote peace conference there to end the hostilities with the Mbundu. Bondi sent his sister Nzinga to represent him at a, in a meeting with Portuguese governor uh, João Correa de Souza. Nzinga was aware of her diplomatically awkward position. She knew of events in the Congo which had led to Portuguese domination of the nominally independent nation. She also recognized, however, that to refuse to trade with the Port Portuguese, she also recognized, however, that to refuse to trade with the Portuguese would remove a potential ally and the major source of guns for her own state. So they're dealing with these different African nations, they're dealing with having, to, they're faced with having to deal with different European nations, okay? Europeans are coming with the gun and they're coming with the cannon. We didn't have a match for that. So we're trying to get guns and they're, and, and at the same time, they're telling these, these African chiefs that you have to provide us with tributes every month or every six months, every three months, whatever the time frame. The tributes, generally speaking, were to provide them with captives, okay, that they would enslave, provide Europeans with captives. And they tell them, if you don't provide us with this number of captives, et cetera, 
we're going to take you and your people. And then you have different groups of Europeans who are supplying African villages, different groups of Africans with guns for them to go raid other African villages to get captives. So Africans found themselves in a precarious position because they're trying to get guns to defend themselves against Europeans because they ain't have guns. Yeah, we had swords and spears and bows and bow and arrows. But that that wasn't that wasn't a match for the firearms. And it definitely was not a match for cannons. Cannons were were cannons were more destructive than firearms. We didn't have cannons. So there, so we're trying to defend ourselves against Europeans and different groups of Europeans. And at the same time, oftentimes having to defend ourselves against rival African uh, villages or ri rival African ethnic groups or, or, or uh, um, kingdoms who and try to protect ourselves from raids as well, because many of them are in the same predicament dealing with Europeans also. The book by um, the book by Dr. Sylvia Dioff called Fighting the Slave Trade. West African strategies really, really gets deep into this history because we fought against the transatlantic slave trade every step of the way. Okay. A lot of people don't understand this history. Uh, if you look at this book here, Dr. Sylvia Dioff is a, uh, is a historian and she's, she's a, a historian of the, um, African diaspora. If we look at this book, just a second here, let's close this out. I got so many tabs open here in um, Google Chrome. All right. Fighting the Slave Trade, West African Strategies. Came out in uh, 2003. Here's a picture of Sylvia and off on the left. I reached out to her a few years ago to do an interview with her, but she was out of the country. I got to reach out to her again because the sister's work is brilliant. Um, while most studies of the slave trade focus on the volume of captives and on their ethnic origins, the question of how the Africans organize their familial and communal lives to resist and assail, to resist and assail it, has not received adequate attention, okay? To resist the transatlantic slave trade, but also to fight against it. But our picture of the slave trade is incomplete without an examination of the ways in which men and women responded to the threat and reality of enslavement and deportation. Fighting the Slave Trade is the first book to explore in a systematic manner the strategies Africans use to protect and defend themselves, the strategies that Africans use to protect and defend, and defend themselves and their communities from the onslaught of the uh, transatlantic slave trade and how they assaulted it. It challenges widely held myths of African pass uh, passivity and general complicity in the slave trade and shows that resistance to uh, enslavement and to involvement in the slave trade was much more pervasive, much more prevalent, okay, much more widespread than has been acknowledged by the orthodox interpretation of historical literature. Focused on West Africa, the essays collected here examine in detail the defensive, protective, and offensive strategies of individuals, families, communities, and states. In chapters discussing the manipulation of the environment, resettlement, the redemption of captives, okay, the transformation of social relations, political centralization, marinage, 
violent assaults on ships and intrapots, shipboard re revolts, and controlled participation, controlled participation in the transatlantic slave trade as a way to procure the means to attack the transatlantic slave trade, mainly getting guns because they would exchange them for guns. And, and, and you saw this depicted in the movie, The Woman King, where they're exchanging African captives for firearms so they can also, because they have to defend themselves, they're trying to defend themselves against Europeans, but also against other African ethnic groups and villages. So this is a complicated history. Fighting the slave trade presents a much more complete picture of the West African slave trade than has been previously available, okay? So uh, check this out at your local African American book dealer or at, or at amazon.com. All right, now, um, okay, so Rob said, Europeans manipulated African tribe in exchanging their captured rival tribesmen to be sold in enslavement. It's more than just manipulation, it was force. It's by force. Either you do this, or we're gonna kill you, or we're gonna capture you. It wasn't just manipulation, it was, it was by force. 